Gita, <coughs> translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Chapter 13, text 21. Karya Karana Kartritve Hetuf Prakritir Uchyate Purusha Sukha Dukha Nam Bhogtritve Hetur Uchyate Nature is said to be the cause of all material causes and effects. Whereas the living entity is the cause of the various sufferings and enjoyments in this world, purport. The different manifestations of body and senses among the living entities are due to material nature. There are 8,400,000 different species of life and these varieties are creations of the material nature. They arise from the different sensual pleasures of the living entity who thus desires to live in this body or that. When he is put into different bodies, he enjoys different kinds of happiness and distress. His material happiness and distress are due to his body and not to himself as he is. In his original state there is no doubt of enjoyment. Therefore that is his real state. Because of the desire to lord it over material nature, he is in the material world. In the spiritual world there is no such thing. The spiritual world is pure, but in the material world everyone is struggling hard to acquire different kinds of pleasures for the body. It might be more clear to state that this body is the effect of the senses. The senses are instruments for gratifying desire. Now the sum total, body and instrument senses, are offered by material nature and as will be clear in the next verse, the living entity is blessed or damned with circumstances according to his past desire and activity. According to one's desires and activity, material nature places one in various residential quarters. The being himself is the cause of his attaining such residential quarters and his attendant enjoyment or suffering. Once placed in some particular kind of body, he comes under the control of material nature because the body, being matter, acts according to the laws of nature. At that time, the living entity has no power to change that law. Suppose an entity is put into the body of a dog. As soon as he is put into the body of a dog, he must act like a dog. He cannot act otherwise. And if the living entity is put into the body of a hog, he cannot act otherwise. Sorry. And if the living entity is put into the body of a hog, then he is forced to eat stool and act like a hog. Similarly, if the living entity is put into the body of a demigod, he must act according to his body. This is the law of nature. But in all circumstances, the super soul is with the individual soul. That is explained in the Vedas, Mundaka Upanishad, as follows, Dva Suparna Sayuja Sakhayaha. The Supreme Lord is so kind upon the living entity that he always accompanies the individual soul and in all circumstances is, is present as the super soul or Paramatma. If you are listening carefully, which I hope you were, because it's not very easy to understand this subject matter. You would have heard that the discussion in this verse of Bhagavad Gita <coughs> is about sukha and dukkha, happiness and distress. Laguna Beach is a place of happiness. Is it not? People come here to be Happy. Everyone's happy in Laguna Beach, isn't it? What a joke. What a big joke. You should be happy. Uh, because the sun's always shining. That's another joke. Well, it's supposed to. Uh, the weather's nice. People are rich. People are good looking. There's good beach. Surfing. Everything's pleasant here. Not happy? Try Hawaii. No. So, well, generally it's thought that 
This is a prestigious area and a good place to live. But the nature of the material world is Dukhalayam, as stated elsewhere here in Bhagavad Gita. The very nature of this world is that it is full of suffering. However, as we read in this purport, in the spiritual world, there is no such thing, no such thing as suffering. Everything there is happiness. That is described in the Brahma Sanghita. That in the spiritual world, kata ganam nartam gananam api vangshi priyasaki. That in the spiritual world, talking is singing. If you're very happy, is anyone ever very happy? Well, you're all devotees, so you're happy. If someone is happy, then they sing. They don't talk, they sing. If someone is very happy, then they don't just walk, but they jump and skip. So in the spiritual world, walking is dancing. And the very dear companion, always present, is the sound of Krishna's flute. So that is the spiritual world. And in this material world, there is simply the hope of happiness. Simply the hope. That is called Durasha. Durashaya, uh, what is it? Durashaya Bahirartha Manina. That is described in Srimad Bhagavatam. There is the hope of being happy, but it's a hope against hope. Because we are concerned with the externals. Concerned with sensual happiness not spiritual happiness. So I actually took up this verse because uh, to discuss today because uh, someone sent me via the internet a question which is a very common question and actually it's the most basic of all questions and everyone should ask this question and get an answer for it. No one should, in this world, no one should be content until they ask this question and get an answer for it. The question, the very common question, why is there suffering? Why is there suffering? There's so much suffering, even in Laguna Beach. <laughs> Maybe more suffering here. In some ways, more suffering. What is suffering? Well, there, there's all kinds of... There's, there are, well, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna states, Janma Mrityu Jaraviyadhi, birth, death, old age and disease. These are four basic kinds of suffering that we see all around us. Apart from that, there's, there are, there's mental suffering, there's uh, traffic fines, there are cars that don't work, relationships that don't work, simply suffering in the material world. So there are, there's gross forms of suffering, just like um, people come on holiday to Southern California. They don't go, you don't find of anyone going on holiday to Afghanistan or Iraq, because these are places which at the present time are places of uh, exacerbated suffering, more suffering. So there's gross suffering, but there's also mental suffering. And we often find that people who have high expectations of, suff of enjoyment, they suffer more. I was, as was just stated, I spent approximately 10 years in and out of Bangladesh. A few years ago, the London School of Economics did a world happiness survey. They asked different questions to people and they found out that the most happy people in the world are in Bangladesh, which was called a basket case in the 1970s by the American ambassador to Bangladesh. Basket case means that however much money you throw in, it's, it's an economically hopeless situation. 
<coughs> so, uh, people that are happy, well, what are the reasons for that? That could be analyzed. One is that you'll hardly find an atheist in that country. You won't find. Or if they are, they're closet atheists. Because it's, it's really not socially acceptable to be an atheist. But another reason is that uh, people, they don't have very high expectations of getting ahead, being a success, making lots of money. They're, so they're content with what they have. They tend to be content. And they tend to be stoic also. I mean, when there's one physical disaster after another, then, and you just, well, you just accept it. I read an article a few months ago about uh, soldiers from America who, uh, after being in Afghanistan and Iraq, and especially if they got some injury, like if their hand got blown off, uh, very, very difficult to adjust to the world when they came back. Because they, there's so much... They've seen so much suffering. So, uh, after I read that, I asked a devotee I know who's an ex-Indian army officer and he'd seen lots of action like Operation Blue Star. Those of you who are a little older know what that... The, anyway, you see. Uh, getting out the Sikh terrorists from the uh, Golden Temple in Amrit and destroying the Golden Temple in the, in the process. It was a very heavy operation. He'd seen, seen lots of action. So I asked him, if I, I told him, I read this article, how traumatized American soldiers tend to be after seeing so and being involved in so much suffering, and in many cases... Uh, suffering severe lifelong injuries. Uh, but, and I expect, the answer I got was the answer I expected, because I didn't, I've seen many Indian soldiers, Indian, uh, ex Indian army personnel, and they don't seem to be traumatized. So I asked him, is it common that they get, people he said, no, they don't get traumatized. So I asked him, what was the reason for that? And he said, it's a different attitude to life. Different attitude to life. That uh, when, you, when you don't take the goal of life to be simply enjoyment, then you don't suffer so much. If we accept that there is God and we are here due to our activities, that we have performed, and that we have we have to suffer or enjoy according to our previous activities. And that ultimately everything is for the good. Ultimately God cares for us and is looking after us. With that basic understanding, people don't suffer very much. But if we're thinking, I have to enjoy, then we'll always suffer. Laguna Beach is a setup for suffering. Isn't it? It's set up for ple- the setup for pleasure means that it's a setup for suffering because even if you mostly people don't get the kind of pleasure that they hope for because everyone hopes for unlimited pleasure and the pleasure you get is very limited so they're disappointed. Uh, I, either you don't get the suffering and you're disappointed or sorry, either you don't get the enjoyment that you'd hope for and therefore you're disappointed, uh, or so many complications arise, or you do get the enjoyment that you had hoped for, everything goes well, but then it doesn't really satisfy you anyway. And again you're disappointed. So either way, it's just a setup for suffering. The attempt to enjoy this world means that one must be frustrated. So actually the question I got was, why is there so much suffering? I mean, wars, mental suffering, and children are suffering in so many ways. Why doesn't God intervene? Why doesn't He do something? He just by if God is there and 
in God we trust, we trust he's there, then why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he just flip a switch and or he doesn't even have to flip a switch just by his desire he can change all that. Why is there so much suffering? Well, actually God does do something. But he speaks Bhagavad Gita. That's what he does. But we have to listen and take the, the message. We have to do something also. Why are we in this position of suffering? Here in this verse it's stated, Purusha Sukha Dukhanam Bhuktritve Hetu Ruchyate The person, the Bhukta, this means the enjoyer, or literally the consumer. The person who has the attitude that let me consume everything that I can in this world, by that very attitude, he causes his enjoyment and distress within it. But actually the enjoyment in this world is distress, and the, the, the distress is also distress. Even those who think they're enjoying, actually they're just, everyone in this world is suffering. So the very attitude of being an enjoyer of this world leads one to be incarcerated in it and leads one to suffer within it. That we uh, desire to be happy is natural because it's the natural state of every living being to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. It's it's an axiom which doesn't need to be uh, explained. Even some people, they may deliberately act in a way to cause their own distress, but that also, in a perverted way, they enjoy that. Like someone may uh, deliberate, or, or they may uh, desire to be sick. What's that called? There's a word for there, some psycholo psychological hypochondria. No, that's when you always think you're sick. There's another term for that. Anyway, some people always desire to be sick so that they can, in a, in a perverse kind of way, enjoy that others will uh, pity them or they'll... Uh, it, it's like an excuse to face the challenges of the world. So, uh, they, enjoy, they, they may enjoy being in a suffering condition. A, a masochist might deliberately inflict pain on himself, but they do, the, they do that because they find some kind of pleasure in it, however perverse. So, uh, the reason there is... Why are we suffering in this world? Whose fault is it? Is it God's fault? Why doesn't he step in and wave a magic wand and make everything perfect and beautiful? Actually, everything is perfect and beautiful. But there are... That is the spiritual world, but there are some conditions to live there. Because if you send a, a, a bunch of perverse people to the spiritual world, people that inflict suffering on others then the, the natural happiness of the spiritual world will be disturbed. If you go to the spiritual world, which is full of Krishna's cows, and you think, let me kill some and make some hamburgers, then uh, you're going to disturb the condition. So there, there are some conditions to live in the spiritual world. One has to be free of envy. Why is there suffering in this world? Well, everyone is contributing to everyone else's suffering, just like that example. If we like to eat meat and slaughter animals, then we may be, uh, we may feel some happiness from it. It's not actually happiness, that's sensual pleasure. That's a great mistake to, to uh, consider sensual pleasure to be happiness. It's not actual happiness. But, but that little pleasure we get is gained by the suffering of others. So, we have to suffer karmic reactions for that. If we cause suffering to others, then the law of the world is that we have to suffer. And it becomes a great complex 
reaction, very complex s- series of reactions, how one person is causing suffering to another, and therefore they have to suffer. Someone else causes this, su- because someone has a desire, a perverse desire to cause suffering to others, they cause suffering to someone who deserves to be that suffering. becomes very, very complex. But we ourselves, it should be understood that we ourselves are the cause of suffering in this world. Because we desire to enjoy making ourselves the enjoyer and exploiting others. In this world, enjoyment is at, by exploiting the resources of this world. So, uh, that is illegal on our part, or improper on our part. Because we are meant to serve Krishna. Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. He is actually the bhokta, or the consumer of everyone else. He doesn't consume in, in the sense of destroying, but Krishna is that person to whom naturally all offerings should be made, And Krishna only is capable of reciprocating in such a way that everyone is satisfied. If we offer everything to Krishna, then everyone becomes satisfied. The example is given, The example is given of putting water at the root of a tree. If we put water at the root of the tree, then the, the trunk, the branches, the twigs, the fruits, the flowers, the whole tree is nourished. But if we try to individually water the twigs, the branches, then it won't work. It doesn't work. Similarly, pranopaharaj chakyatendriyanam tataiva sarvahanam achuteja. Similarly, if we Uh, place food in the stomach, then the whole body is nourished. But if we try to individually nourish, put some injection in the ear, put some injection in the eye, that sounds very dangerous, doesn't it? Then we won't, uh, we won't nourish that. Rather, we will cause harm to it. So, Krishna is that person by whom offering everything to Every Krishna is satisfied and everyone is satisfied. Yasmin Tushte Jagat Tushta. If he is satisfied, everyone is satisfied. That is the natural order. But when we reject that natural order and try to make ourselves enjoyers, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just like the if the hand, if the hand thinks I'm doing so much work, I'll enjoy the food myself. But there's no way that the hand can do. The hand must go to, the hand must offer food to the stomach to get its own nourishment. So in the same way, if we don't offer all our endeavors, all our energy, all our love, all our desires to Krishna, it doesn't work. It, it creates a, an unnatural s- situation in which everyone, instead of cooperating to offer everything to Krishna, becomes a competitor with everyone else to enjoy the resources of the world. And therefore, a suffering condition is produced. So, we could, the, the question is then, why doesn't Krishna just rectify it? Why doesn't he change it? Because uh, Krishna could do that. He could program us so that we just act for the pleasure of Krishna. But Krishna is not pleased exactly if if everyone acts like a programmed robot to do what Krishna wants or to serve Krishna, then that is not pleasing to Krishna. Because uh, what is pleasing to Krishna is not so much the act of offering, but the love behind it. And love means a voluntary offering of ourselves to Krishna. So love cannot be forced. Krishna could change the whole situation. Okay, uh, 
everyone just love me. But love means voluntary. How will, you could say, Krishna will, how will these wars be stopped? Then everyone's mind will become pure. Sabko Sanmati De Bhagavan. Yes. Mahatma Gandhi used to sing. Uh, Sabko, let, oh Bhagavan, give everyone good intelligence, good way of thinking. Bhagavan is doing, he's giving us Bhagavad Gita. But we are not taking it. We think we have a better idea than Krishna. Or we ignore Krishna. Or we reinterpret Krishna. Uh, if we simply follow Krishna's advice and surrender our lives to him, offer everything in his service, then naturally we will become happy. And if everyone does that, everyone will be happy. Although it's not expected that everyone will follow this because in this material world it is, is, it is as if we have developed a criminal mentality. We have a perverse mentality of not wanting to serve Krishna. So, uh, the suffering is actually caused by ourselves. We don't have to be in this situation. Krishna gives us the independence to choose to serve him or not to serve him. If we serve him, then we live happily in the spiritual world. If we don't like to serve him, if we have a rebellious attitude, then we come to the material world. Uh, the independence is there because without the independence, we cannot serve Krishna voluntarily. Without voluntary service, there's no love. If it's, if it's all just programmed, then where's the love? The love means a voluntary offering to Krishna. So, uh, Krishna doesn't allow people with perverse desires to enter the spiritual world because they will disturb the whole atmosphere there. Krishna lives in the spiritual world with his loving devotees. It's an attitude of perfect harmony and cooperation in the service of Krishna. But if someone comes in with an envious attitude, they'll, they'll want to, they'll be critical of Krishna. They'll want to harm Krishna. They'll want to harm Krishna's devotees. They'll create disharmony. They'll go against the principle of pure, unmotivated, devotional, loving service to Krishna. So such persons are not allowed. It's like uh, in the state, there, there is a prison where all the people are kept who are not fit to live in civil society because they don't behave properly. They cause such a disturbance that it's considered better for their good and for that of the broader society, that they are kept away from others, because they simply cause so much harm that they should be kept separately. So similarly, this material world is a big, like a big prison, where we're kept separately, so that we uh, don't disturb the pure devotees in the spiritual world. We don't disturb Krishna. But Krishna comes and he sends his pure devotees to give us information of the spiritual world. He comes to invite us. He comes and speaks Bhagavad Gita. He comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and brings the bliss of the Sankirtan movement so that everyone can join that. He gives us so much opportunity to join him. He's calling us. He himself is not happy that we are rejecting him. Krishna is always happy. Nothing can obstruct his happiness. Yet he feels some unhappiness. That why are all these people away from me? Why are they living away from me? We don't have to remain in this situation. We can come out of it. There doesn't have to be suffering. But we have conjointly created this situation. So this Krishna conscious movement is meant for giving information of the spiritual world where there is singing and dancing eternally. It is meant for giving information of spiritual life as practiced in this world. And it is meant for reforming the whole society.
the whole world at the present time is extremely confused, extremely distressed, and appears to be on the verge of uh, various disasters in various ways. Which isn't surprising if we consider that for every action there is a reaction. And for many years there have been piling up. Now there's a big stockpile of uh, unrequited sinful actions. So it's not surprising if there are to be severe sinful reactions in the form of uh, wars. Actually, wars are almost something of the past. Now they're, they're not so much wars, it's just any time someone can just blow you up in any time. Or terror, what they call terrorism is more prominent than wars, than full-out wars, which is fairly straightforward. There's one army here, another army there, and they face each other and fight it out. But nowadays it's but anyway, this kind of uh, extremely nasty violence, natural disturbances, food shortages, uh, Laguna Beach is all set up for a tsunami. <laughs> if there is one, well, it, I mean, it just can happen any time, right? You just don't know. Uh, so, uh, all kinds of... Uh, 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 weather disturbances that create uh, these, uh, first of all, it, it, it create hurricanes, they destroy so much houses and properties and lives, and then floods, and then uh, bushfires, and then all these disturbances that leads to the uh, crops failing, and then the prices going up, and, and on and on and on and on. So actually, this is Krishna's mercy in one way. Because uh, if people don't realize what suffering they're causing to themselves and others, then Krishna just turns the temperature up a bit. <laughs> and lets people realize how much suffering there is. And if people are a little bit pious... In great suffering, they will think, oh, we must have done something wrong. Let us turn to God. So let us turn to God. Of course, turning to God, that can also be uh, misused. And then, as uh, atheists never tire of pointing out, in the name of God, so many atrocities have been caused within history. So this Krishna conscious movement is not meant for causing atrocities. It's meant for inviting everyone into the Sankirtan of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama, Rama, Hari, Hari. We invite everyone to join. We are also having a holy war. But the war is without guns, bombs, mortars, tanks, none of this. The weapons are the cartels and mudangas. And going town to town, village to village, all over the world, and inviting everyone to join in the Sankirtan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And also giving knowledge, giving proper knowledge why we are suffering in this world, how we can come out from it, that there is God. And God actually loves us. His name is Krishna. He loves us means uh, He gives us the opportunity, He gives everyone the opportunity to join in that Sankirtan. There's no chosen people. It's not that some people go to God and the rest are sent to hell. It's not like that. Everyone has the opportunity to engage in this Sankirtan. And Sankirtan is so auspicious 
that even anyone who hears the holy name of Krishna being chanted is immensely benefited. Even people who themselves don't chant Hare Krishna, if others even hear the chanting of Hare Krishna, they are benefited. How beneficial is this Sankirtan movement? So undoubtedly it's a very bad time. Oh, there's another part to that question. When Krishna loves his cows, why does he allow so many to be slaughtered? So, yes, yeah, certainly Krishna loves cows, but uh, again, ac according to complex karmas, it may be that someone, some living being, has caused uh, suffering to others, so they take a certain body where they are uh, tortured and killed, and certain people have such sinful desires that they perform such sinful activities. So, uh, again, Krishna gives us a minute independence. He doesn't force us. If you want to love me, love me. If you don't, then there's the material world and everyone inflicts suffering on everyone else. So, uh, Krishna, he doesn't force even... Cows are killed, devotees sometimes are killed. It's a very complex chain of action and reaction. Krishna from time to time intervenes. He comes. At the end of Kali Yoga he will come as Kalki Avatar. There's no more preaching at that time. There's no more discussion of philosophy. When he comes as Kalki Avatar then simply... Uh, everyone at that time is a complete demon, Asura, and Krishna, in the form of Kalki Avatar, simply kills them. So in the meantime, the attempt to reform others by persuasion, by inviting them to the join in the Sankirtan, uh, by giving them Krishna Prasadam, all of this is going on. But people have the choice to act piously or sinfully. And at, in the present age, People are generally choosing to act in, unfortunately, in very sinful ways. And activities which are very sinful, that means which will cause severe sinful reactions, which cause intense suffering to others, they are commonplace. Eating meat is, uh, that is, the slaughterhouses and the whole, uh, Culture around the slaughterhouses it means extreme cruelty. Abortions are considered normal. Contraception is considered normal. These are all very uh, intoxication, uh, taking various uh, alcohol and various intoxicants. This is all very sinful. This is Kali Yuga, the age in which people are very sinful. In this age, people with very sinful desires take birth as human beings. So it's to be expected. It's a bad age. But there's a good thing about it also. Kale doshanidhe rajan astihieko mahan guna kirtana deva krishna se mukta sangaparang bhajit. In this age of Kali, which is like an ocean of faults, there is one great saving quality that simply by the kirtan of the name of Krishna everyone can be delivered from this ocean of suffering and attain to the highest destination. They can go back home, back to Godhead, to the place of Krishna. So we invite everyone to take part in this Sankirtan movement and to distribute this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita as it is. The whole world is suffering in ignorance. People don't know what they're doing. They're so uh, frantically trying to enjoy this world that they don't stop to think how much suffering they're causing to themselves and others. So this Bhagavad Gita as it is, is supposed to, uh, is being distributed for the purpose of giving people clear knowledge of who we are, why we are suffering in this world, who is God, 
how we can come out from this suffering position and attain to pure, eternal, fully blissful life. Hare Krishna. Is there any question about this? It's a, the, the principle is actually very simple, but it's often people difficult for people to understand. The difficulty comes because our minds are complicated by unnecessary theories, convoluted philosophies, but the principle is very simple. We are all eternal servants of Krishna. We have fallen into this material world due to forgetting Krishna. We, are, we suffer and cause others to suffer by our perverted desires to exploit this material world. If we simply rectify our consciousness and agree to serve Krishna as he directs us, then we become free from the contaminations of this material world and become eligible to re-enter the spiritual world. Very simple. Hare Krishna. So, yes, any question, please. In the spiritual world, by contra, there are animals there. To be an animal eternally, is it not suffering? No, in this material world, the, the form of an animal is considered lower than that of a human. But in the spiritual world, uh, all living beings partake in Krishna's love. It's, in the spiritual world, to have the body of an animal is not a punishment. In this material world, to have any kind of body is a punishment. But the animal birth is for persons of very low consciousness. But in the spiritual world, the animal birth is one of full consciousness of Krishna, but one likes to serve Krishna in that form. One takes the, one is eternally in the form of a cow because one likes to serve Krishna in that way. For instance. Can the animal become a human? Why would they want to? They're fully satisfied. They've taken that form to serve Krishna in that form and serving Krishna is fully satisfactory. Why should they want to become a human? They're already fully satisfied. It's not a lower position to be a cow. Sorry? Are the animals as much conscious? Yes, full consciousness. Satchit Ananda. Full existence, full consciousness and full bliss for everyone. In the spiritual world, the animals are blissful, the plants are blissful, the air is blissful, the water is blissful, Krishna is blissful, the flute is blissful, the trees are blissful. Humans, animals, everyone. That, that is, that, therefore, that is called the Chit Jagat, Chij Jagat, or Chinmai Jagat. Everything there is fully conscious. There's no dullness or... or uh, uh, or, uh, and no one is deprived of the, the full bliss of Krishna consciousness. It's a lot better place than Laguna Beach. <laughs> so let us all prepare to go to the spiritual world. And this temple is a replica of the spiritual world in as much as the only purpose here is to serve Krishna. So here there should be constant hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, serving Krishna in various ways by feeding him with all kinds of nice foods that he likes to eat. Everything for the pleasure of Krishna. That is the meaning of a temple of Krishna. Then people can come and they can enter the spiritual world by joining this association.
Yeah, anything else? Today we went out, the whole group of people went out to do the monthly sankirtan where we knocked on the doors and, and present books and invite people to the temple. And we found, just like you were saying, people have so many preconceived notions. And of course it is easier to try to present something simple to get it into them. But even then there are so many preconceived notions. To get it people have many preconceived notions. When you're going door to door in book distribution, we don't try to take the position of Krishna instructing Arjuna <laughs> and, and, and give them a whole Bhagavad Gita. Simple, simple be yes, it's better to keep it simple. Yeah, it's very difficult to get through to people because people, their consciousness is uh, a long way from Arjuna's. Even Arjuna wasn't ready to hear Krishna. What Krishna had to say? Arjuna, he didn't ask Krishna... Please give me a discourse on absolute knowledge. Arjuna was just looking for some excuse to avoid the battle. He didn't, he, he just told me, you know, tell me whether to fight or not. That's all he wanted to know. He didn't ask for a discourse. And Krishna slapped him verbally and told him, you're a fool. Ashochananda Shocha Strong Pragya Vahadangs Chabhashasi. You're speaking as if, hey, Arjuna, you're speaking like you're a, you're a big scholar. You become a big pundit all of a sudden. But you're a damn fool. You don't know even the most basic point of spiritual knowledge. You're lamenting for that which should not be lamented for. So Krishna verbally slapped him. Arjuna thought, well, I'm being so good and pious and considerate of others. I've become such a saintly person, and Krishna slapped him and told him, you're talking all nonsense. So, you might try that also on Book Distribution. Whatever works. Sometimes it works. But it has to, not by formula. You, if you go by formula, knock on people's doors, they open the door and say, you're a damn fool, you don't know anything. But it may sometimes come spontaneously. And then, it, then it may, may have that effect. You were talking about two people being envious, but I've known especially in a town like Laguna Beach where some people have a lot of money. So it seems that the people who have a lot of money, not always, but many times, are much more envious and worried that someone may take it or they may pay on some tax than the people who have less. Yeah, that's a commonly noted syndrome. You know, the people who are very rich, they suffer more. They're full of anxiety. Chintama parimayamcha. It's described in Bhagavad Gita. Persons of demoniac mentality, they're always in anxiety. Someone In anxiety, someone will take the money away. Uh, this... Uh, Previously, the most, the richest man in the world lived just north of Los Angeles. Paul Getty was his name, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Oil billionaire. In those days, to be a billionaire was something really big. Still is. So then his grandson was kidnapped for a ransom, and then he didn't pay up the bill quick enough, so he got, they send the ear of his grandson. So, so much money, so much prestige, but had to suffer. He had to suffer. He couldn't avoid. So, actually, what is that? The, that's stated in Bhagavatam. Nairasha Paramasukam. It literally means disappointment is the greatest happiness. But the etymologically, it means that one who has no hope is the happiest. One who has no hope for any material progress or enjoyment, they're the most happy. Material desire is the cause of suffering. So 
So the Buddhists, they say, well, just stop all desire. But that's not possible. Because as living beings, we have desire. We, 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 and then we're full of desires, but we have to purify the desires. That means to focus our desires on how Krishna will be pleased. Instead of thinking how I will be pleased, we think how Krishna will be pleased. Then automatically we'll be pleased. The same example. If the hand thinks, damn the stomach, let me just please myself, then he he'll, he'll, must suffer. But if he thinks, if the hand thinks, let me feed the stomach, and the stomach is satisfied, the hand is satisfied, all the limbs of the body are satisfied. So in the same way, if we uh, focus our desires on pleasing Krishna, then automatically we become satisfied. Anything else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming after a day dis out distributing this knowledge. This question is something that people may often ask you. Why is there suffering? Actually, the Pope was recently on TV, the first time a Pope had a TV interview. And there were questions sent to him. So many of the questions were, why is there suffering in this world? He couldn't answer it. He, his answer was, we cannot know. <laughs> which is an improvement on the old line, which is because someone a long time ago ate an apple. So, I guess, I guess it's an improvement. But we can say, we can say, because we have the knowledge that Srila Prabhupada kindly conveyed to us, coming in the cyclic succession from Krishna, Purusha Sukha Dukkhanam Bhuktit Vehetu Ruchate. Because we have the attitude of wanting to enjoy this world, therefore we have to, we, we create our own so-called happiness and distress. But actually we have nothing to do with this world. When we realize that I don't belong here, I belong at Krishna's lotus feet. I'm meant for serving Krishna. And automatically, all suffering ends. Jeev Krishna Das Ebishas Koraleta Ardukana Radha Krishna Bol Bol Bolo Reshava. This is the simple formula. When we understand that I am the I am a Jiva, I am an eternal servant of Krishna, I'm not this body, uh, then we simply accept this, we're firmly convinced of this, and then no more distress. Distress will not remain. And then what's left? Then we chant Hare Krishna. That's all. Simple. So people may ask us this question. Why is there so much suffering? If they ask, it's a good question. Most people haven't come to the point of asking that question yet. They're suffering so much, and they know they're suffering, but they're still hoping, durasha, bad hope, hope that cannot be fulfilled. They're still hoping that, well, anyway, let me take some, some kind of pill, some, to help to adjust my mentality, or let me, uh, drink away my troubles, drown my troubles. All the, all the problems are caused by my wife. I'll throw her out and get a new one. <laughs> or husband. You see, uh, I just married the wrong person, so let's just change. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Recently, this Liz Taylor died. How many husbands did she get through in the end? Before she died? Eight. Eight. She was in competition with Henry VIII. At least she, <laughs> at least she didn't kill her husband. Because Eddie Fisher, who was very thirsty, said he was afraid to get up and use the bathroom or he would lose his place. Ah. Was she happy? 
Well, probably in all the uh, photos, they always show them smiling, right, the film stars? They're always shown smiling. They have to be smiling, but inside they're crying. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And externally Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is crying, but internally it's all bliss. In the material world, happiness and distress, it's both distress. And in the spiritual world, happiness and distress, it's all bliss. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.